Hey, I want to welcome everybody to the Emory ADRC Virtual Brain Health Forum. I'm John Lewis, and if you have a comfortable chair, go get it right now. A real comfortable chair, because we're going to work on that entire body in the chair. We're going to work on that core, that upper body, and plus, the main thing is cardio, because cardio is life. So let's get going. Get this music. Let's warm that body up. I'm going to start with that waistline, but we're going to get that circulation going. Rock with me. Come on. Come on. We're taking it nice and easy right now, but we're going to take the tempo up. Come on, give me that waistline right here. Now add a little twist with it. Come on. Can we just leap forward? We're telling you, saying, come on back, warm up for me. Bring it back up. Keep twisting. There we go. tempo up a little bit. Watch this now. 
just wanted to make sure we get warmed up because you have a lot of information that we want you to take in. And remember this, always do something good for your temple because it is a gift to you. I'm John Lewis, and I want to say see you later. Bye. Thank you, John Lewis. And as always, we're all revved up and ready to go. At this time, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Alan Levy, Director of the Goizueta Alzheimer's Disease Research Center and Chairman of the Department of Neurology here at Emory University. Dr. Alan Levy will bring us greetings and an update on what we're doing here at the Goizueta Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Dr. Levy. Thank you, Monica. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This is my great pleasure to uh, welcome you all to our 19th Brain Health Forum from the Goizet Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. I think I've been privileged to give the introduction to most of these 19, and um, they get better every time. Uh, I just want to, in advance, thank our terrific panelists. I think you're all in for a really informative and interesting afternoon. We're going to be talking about the spectrum of dementias, so not just Alzheimer's disease, but the other common disease pathophysiologies that contribute to the symptoms of dementia, including Dr. James Galvin uh, in Florida, Dr. Robert Stern in Boston. Uh, thank you both for spending the time with us here in Atlanta virtually today. And then our own homegrown Karima Benamour and Dr. Lenore Higginbotham, both of our neurology faculty, be talking about um, other dementing illnesses. Suzette Binford, who's going to be talking about some of our uh, new programs here. And then also I want to welcome uh, Mr. Todd Graham from the Lewy Body Disorders Association, uh, close partners here um, in Atlanta and making a major contribution to the um, advocacy for LBD uh, across the globe. So obviously these are extraordinary times for us. Uh, most of our brain health fora have been in person and we've always had great attendance. It's is one of the best outcomes of the pandemic is that we and others in the research and clinical community have learned how to pivot and connect with all of you uh, through Zoom and other telemedicine mechanisms. Uh, because of that, we actually can extend our reach considerably uh, it's fantastic to see that we have over 500 participants right now listening in on this uh, Brain Health Forum. So we hope to make it a, a great forum for all of you and welcome you back to future ones. Uh, I'm sure we will want to continue this type of venue even when we can return to a safe, uh, safe distancing in person um, and welcome, welcome you all to do that. Obviously, next week's a big week. Uh, you all know what I'm talking about. Nope, it's not the US presidential election. Next week, the FDA will be meeting to review one of the first disease modifying drugs candidates for Alzheimer's disease, aducanumab, a uh, monoclonal antibody for which there has been some data presented by the company Biogen uh, to um, advocate for its approval as a drug. We'll see the outcome. It's been a very interesting journey. Um, but it really marks, I think, the progress that we're seeing in the field, whether that drug gets approved or not. Uh, what we are seeing from a research perspective is a lot of progress going across the board. Novel targets are being developed, uh, new treatment trials are underway, and we're making terrific advances with diagnosis. I think one of the things you'll learn this afternoon is that the complexities of dementias are considerable. Uh, and most frequently, individuals have mixed pathologies in their brains. And so it's not just the pathology of Alzheimer's disease, traditional amyloid plaques and tangles, but also the pathologies of Parkinson's disease like Lewy bodies um, that are aggregates of synuclein, which contribute to the disease. Uh, head injury contributes and can cause other pathologies, including the tauopathies. Um, and then, of course, vascular injury is uh, also contributing in many individuals to their dementing process. So for us, the future is one where we have diagnostic tools to get clarity on which of these different pathologies are contributing to dementias of different individuals, and then using very specific treatments uh, in the future to intervene. And hopefully one day uh, soon, not too distance, we'll have a whole new array of diagnostic tools and we will have treatments to uh, work together with them in companion. 
So with that, let me turn it back to Monica. Again, welcome all of you and uh, thank you speakers for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Levy. And it's my task at this time, before I get too far into our program, to kind of set the agenda and let you know a little bit more about what we're gonna talk about. Before I do that, I'd like to thank our different sponsors for our event. First of all, our corporate sponsors, UPS, Cox Enterprise, the Coca-Cola Company, Georgia Power Foundation, the Alzheimer's Foundation of America, uh, the Alzheimer's Association, the Emory Healthy Aging, study and the Registry for Remembrance Community Coalition. This is an organization of about 23 different civic and um, religious or faith-based organizations that support education in communities of color and support our efforts here at the Goizueta Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Some of our key co co uh, excuse me, co community coalition partners and longtime partners ever since we've been doing this for almost 13 years now include the Atlanta chapter of the Lynx Incorporated, the Atlanta alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta, and Chi Tau Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. Other coalition members include the Big Bethel AME Church, the Atlanta Black Nurses Association, the Cascade United Methodist Church, Chi Tau Omega Chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha, Kappa Lambda Omega Chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha, uh, the Lou Walker Senior Center, St. Paul's Episcopal Church, Ben Hill United Methodist Church, um, and the James Dixon Foundation. So thank you all. Thank you so much for both your financial support, your commitment to research and making sure that all of us participate in clinical research looking for a cure for Alzheimer's disease. Now, to move into the more academic part of what we're about to talk about, my task here right this moment is to introduce you to the different types of dementia. For those of us who've been on this program for a number of years, you're probably familiar with the basics of dementia, but some of us are not. So if you'll just beg our indulgence for a few minutes, I'm going to kind of do a little rehash of what we call Dementia 101. First of all, one of the things that's important to know and why we're engaged in this research and educational activity in the first place is that Alzheimer's disease and related dementias is a growing epidemic for which there is no cure. Who gets Alzheimer's and related dementias? Okay, most commonly it's gonna be somebody over the age of 85, but we have about 20% of the people between the ages of 75 and 84 who have signs and symptoms of cognitive dysfunction or memory loss more commonly. And then even more so, we have less than 5% of the people between the ages of 65 and 74 who may have signs and symptoms of dementing disorder. Most importantly, what you need to know, particularly if it's Alzheimer's disease, is there's about a 20 year period of time between the onset of what we call pathology or the undoings in the brain and the clinical manifestations or what somebody sees. We know that in the United States right now, we have nearly 6 million, 5.7 million people who have Alzheimer's or related dementia. And by the year 2050, we're gonna have nearly 30 million people. So here in the state of Georgia, we estimate that there are about 150,000 people who have been given an actual diagnosis of Alzheimer's. We estimate that there are probably more like half a million people who have signs and symptoms of dementing disorders, but have not yet received a clinical evaluation or diagnosis of exactly what's causing their brain dysfunction. These are some projections for what Alzheimer's and related dementias are gonna be like around the country. Uh, in Georgia, by the year 2025, we estimate that we'll probably have a 27% increase in the number of people who will have a confirmed diagnosis. Alabama, 17% increase from 2019 to 2025. Florida, 28.6%. And in Illinois, which is in the central part of the United States, at least 10 to 15% of the people, greater number of people affected by Alzheimer's and related dementias. So what is dementia? What is a neurocognitive disorder? Is it Alzheimer's? Are they all the same thing? 
Well, they're not all the same thing, but most importantly, the big take home point is developing dementia or brain dysfunction or memory loss is not a normal part of aging. Let me repeat that. Dementia is not a normal part of aging. Their symptoms, their behaviors that have a tendency to interfere with your ability to take care of yourself, maintain your business affairs, conduct your job, do what you need to do to take care of yourself. Again, neurocognitive disorders, any type of dementia, they are not normal parts of aging. They are pathologic problems that have a cause, but they're not found in everybody, but it's not normal. So what happens when you develop a dementia or a neurocognitive disorder? On the screen, you see six different functions of what your brain does. The first one is something called complex attention, which is consistent with what we're doing right now. You're listening, you're looking at a screen. You have executive function, which is the ability to plan, to organize. You have learning and memory, which is really pretty much self-explanatory. It's acquiring words, remembering items, um, just re recall. Like I know I'm Dr. Parker, but tomorrow if I had dementia, I might not know that I'm Dr. Parker. Perceptual motor. You know, brain's ability to coordinate your body's function, your ability to walk across the room, your ability to control the urge to urinate, to defecate. Language, using the right word for the right thing, wrecking in whether you're using standard English, if that's your native tongue, or using a foreign language, excuse me, a foreign language, if that's your native language. And social cognition which is using socially appropriate behaviors and socially appropriate environments and doing the right thing. Let me go back there. I want you to know that there are six different things that we measure when we look at somebody having a problem with their brain, okay? Deficits in two or more of these different brain functions indicate that you have a dementia. It's not just memory loss, it's other things as well. So what are the different types of dementia? We're gonna talk about this. More than half of the dementias that are diagnosed are categorized as Alzheimer's type dementia, followed by a mixed dementia, which may be Alzheimer's with vascular disease, which Dr. Benemer is gonna talk about, or Alzheimer's with Lewy bodies, which Dr. Galvin will talk about, or maybe 6% have other, something like chronic traumatic encephalopathy, with, with, which is what Dr. Stern is gonna talk about. Again, there are several different types of dementia. Alzheimer's is just one. And remember, there are deficits in different parts of the brain that cause the problems we see. So what are some of the symptoms that you might see if somebody's developing a dementing disorder? Okay, we got memory loss, but again, your brain helps you do other things. So repeating words, stories, or phrases, loss of bowel and bladder habit, inability to independently dress yourself, groom yourself, toilet yourself, walking, coordinating the activity to stabilize your gait, falls. It's not just because you're frail elderly, that's a brain function, posterior brain function. Personality changes, psychotic features. It's important for you to know also, and this is why we start off with exercise, that 30% of all dementias, I didn't say Alzheimer's, but all dementias can be prevented by managing certain lifestyle events. Chief among them are increasing your education through secondary school so you can become literate and become knowledgeable about how you can take better care of yourself, managing chronic diseases like high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, um, getting your hearing checked. A lot of us don't pay attention to that, but getting your hearing checked and having a complete hearing evaluation is one way to help you manage um, signs and symptoms or that may be associated with dementia. Reducing physical inactivity. That's why we're stressing exercise. Every time we open up with exercise, we want you to exercise because sedentary activity and not being physically active is a risk factor for developing a brain dysfunction. Treating depression. Depression is something that we can diagnose and unlike dementia of any kind, we do have a treatment for depression. Reducing social isolation, keeping engaged, participating in webinars, continuing to participate in your civic and social organizations, and then also evaluating and sleeping, uh, evaluating for sleep disorders. So what are the sorts of things that I can do that might protect my brain and keep me from having any kind of dementing disorder. 
Well, education, as I alluded to earlier, chronic disease management, if you've been diagnosed with high blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, manage all of that so that you don't develop strokes. Strokes and heart disease are main risk factors for vascular dementia, which Dr. Higgin, uh, Dr. Benimer is gonna talk about a little bit later. Daily aerobic exercise, what should I eat? What kinds of things should I eat? Well, we're advocating the Mediterranean diet or the MIND diet, which is a combination of the DASH or the cardiovascular diet and the Mediterranean diet. Consuming one glass of red wine with meals, not excessive alcohol consumption and maintaining an ideal body weight. Okay, what are some of the risk factors for developing a dementing disorder? Okay, age, the older we get, the older our cells become, the more likely there is to be some kind of dysfunction or malfunction, if you will. Gender, we know that females are more likely to develop dementia versus men. Traumatic brain injury, which is something that Dr. Stern is gonna educate us about a little bit later. APOE4 and other genes that are associated with Alzheimer's type dementia. Chronic tobacco use, hypertension, and diabetes and obesity because of their association with strokes and cardiovascular disease, sleep disorders, and hearing loss. So let's look at those protective factors again. Education, managing chronic disease, increasing your physical activity, maintaining an ideal body weight as close to it as we can, and consuming a Mediterranean or DASH diet. People are gonna ask us, what should I eat? What should I eat? I want you to look up the Mediterranean diet. I want you to look up the MIND diet. But just remember, keep your plate colorful, eat lots of fruits and vegetables, and slow down on the fried foods. We're in the deep south, we like fried stuff, but you can't have it all the time. And look at some of the risk factors. There are two things up there we can't do anything about. One of those is our ability, our age, which is probably something that's genetically reinforced, our gender and our genes, we inherit those. But everything else on that list is something that we can control. Treatment. As of right this moment, there is no definitive treatment that you can go and purchase that cures Alzheimer's. We are hopeful that the drug that comes up next year may be a good disease modifying therapy or something that slows or stops the progression of the disease process really associated with Alzheimer's. But as of right this moment, we don't really have anything that you can come to my office and say, Dr. Parker, I need you to write me a prescription for this. We don't have that yet. Right now we're conducting research and we need your participation in all of that research to make sure that we find cures, treatments and diagnostics that are effective and useful for all segments of the population. I have some websites up here that I'd like you to look at and consult if you want more information. Again, we do these workshops, these talks, and that helps you, but look at those websites, the Alzheimer's Association website, Alzheimer's University, and our Emory University website has lots of information that's evidence-based, which means it's been proven to be true and accurate. It's true science that will help you with this disease process. At this time, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. James Galvin, who is the professor, a professor of clinical and biomedical science and associate dean for clinical research at the Florida Atlantic University. Dr. Galvin um, is a neurologist and he can talk about a number of different things, but one of the things that he's gonna talk to us about is Lewy body dementia. Dr. Galvin. Thank you, Dr. Parker. Uh, it, I'm delighted to be with you, even if it's only virtually. Um, uh, I hope that uh, we'll have a nice little conversation and, uh, and I already enjoyed the conference so far and I I'm, I'm imagine it's only gonna be, get better as, as we go on. Um, so, let's see. Oops, wrong, wrong slide, one second. Here, I gotta find my uh, slides here. Here we go. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little about Lewy body dementia. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Parker introduced me as part of one university, but I recently moved. So um, I'm actually at University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. <clears throat> so, but, uh, but everything else is the same. Um, 
And uh, I'm going to show, I'm going to share a little bit of research data. I'm really going to cover the disease, but I'm going to talk a little bit of research. And again, I just want to acknowledge that I, I work with a large research team uh, with collaborators around the world um, and supported by the grants from the National Institutes of Health, as well as a number of family foundations. Um, so I want to talk about Lewy by disease, and I want to pitch it as the most common disease that you may never have heard of. Um, so Lewy body dementia is the second most common cause of dementia after Alzheimer's disease. Um, estimates are somewhere in the 10 to 12 percent range, although uh, if you look at autopsy series, so people have come to autopsy, it's actually quite common, maybe up to 40 percent of brains have Lewy body disease, but they may not have the clinical symptoms of it. Um, Lewy body disease includes two different uh, but similar diseases. One is dementia with Lewy bodies and the other is Parkinson's disease dementia. Um, one is pretty straightforward. So you have Parkinson's disease first and then you develop a dementia later, that's PDD. Uh, dementia with Lewy bodies is really sort of a mixed bag. It can have lots of different types of presentations. Um, it's, these diseases are more common in men. So Alzheimer's and frontal temporal degeneration and several other of the dementias are more common in women, but the Lewy body disorders are more common in men. Um, the, the, they may decline faster in Lewy body disease than in Alzheimer's disease. And we estimate that's about 1.4 million Americans um, will have Lewy body dementia. Um, We'll talk about this next, but one of the real problems is that because people haven't heard of it, there's often a, de a delay in the recognition, diagnosis, and then, of course, in the treatment. And that can have lots of issues related to the family. Now, I'm going to do something that I don't often do, right? And before I do it, I just want to tell you that I never compare one disease to another. It's not fair to anybody who has any disease that I'm going to, to compare diseases. So with that as a disclaimer, I really want to drive home the point of this is a disease that's common that you've never heard of. So I want to talk about some diseases that you have heard of probably. So there are about a million people with multiple sclerosis. There are about 800,000 people a year who have a stroke. There are about 700,000 people uh, who have a brain tumor. Uh, muscular dystrophy, and if you're, result, if you're my age, you remember you know, the Jerry Lewis telethon for muscular dystrophy, there are about 250,000 people with muscular dystrophy. There are only 30,000 people with Huntington's disease and 12,000 people with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. Now, I would say that most of the audience has heard of these diseases, uh, but we're talking you know, 1.4 million people have a disease for which many people and many healthcare providers have not heard of. Uh, and that causes a problem. What really drives home the message is when someone famous has a disease. So for example, some important people who've had Lewy body dementia, uh, Robin Williams, um, and now currently is a movie out about Robin Williams's life and how he dealt with Lewy body dementia. Um, Estelle Getty from the Golden Girls had Lewy body dementia. Al Arbor, any hockey fans out there, he was a Hall of Fame player and a Hall of Fame coach for the New York Islanders. Uh, Ted Turner has Lewy body dementia and he's discussed this publicly. Um, Jerry Sloan, a basketball coach for the Utah Jazz had Lewy body dementia. Uh, Bill Buckner, um, any baseball fans out there remember Bill Buckner, first baseman uh, for the Cubs and then for the Red Sox and the famous little squib hit that Mookie Wilson hit that scrambled through his legs that allowed Mets to win the World Series back then. As a Yankee fan, a terrible memory in my, on my part. Um, Casey Kasem, a famous uh, radio personality, had Lewy body dementia. Uh, Dina, Dina Merrill, a very famous actress. Um, I remember Dina Merrill um, on the old Batman TV series. She played Calamity Jane. Um, and Donald Featherstone. Now, you're all probably saying, who's Donald Featherstone? But, but there's actually a clue in this picture. So Donald Featherstone was the inventor of the pink lawn flamingo. So he had Lewy body dementia. So a number of famous people had Lewy body dementia. Why am I talking about this? Well, because this is my famous person with Lewy body dementia. This is my grandfather. So this is me uh, when I was born, um, full head of hair, 10 pound baby. Um, so my grandfather, uh, I grew up with, uh, lived in a two family home and spent every day uh, seeing my grandfather. Um, 
Oops, uh, this is me getting confirmed uh, in church and my grandfather was my sponsor. And during my junior year in high school, my grandfather was driving me home from a swim meet um, and made the world's slowest left-hand turn. And we were broadsided by another car. Luckily, no one was hurt, but I remember turning him to, at the time and said, Grandpa, what's wrong? That was a really strange turn. Uh, and he reported that uh, it was the car's fault. Uh, you may have heard stories like this before. Um, and then he was at work and he was a person who climbed in and out of machines to grease them and keep them going, worked for Colgate Palmolive um, and fell off a ladder, uh, went to the emergency room and the emergency room for, for his broken ribs, my, the ER doctor turned to my grandmother and says, how long has your husband had Parkinson's? And my grandmother says, what are you talking about? And my grandfather's hand was shaking like this and we just had never even paid attention to this. Uh, and then over the next 10 years ago, he, so he developed progressive motor and memory symptoms and hallucinations and eventually passed away. Um, uh, and, and so I think everybody can talk about, you know, who their important person is. Um, this is a slide of the pathology of Lewy body dementia. Um, and so uh, this is a classic Lewy body. Um, and so there's this little pink uh, dense core with this pale halo. And this isn't a neuron that makes dopamine, which is the chemical that helps us move. Um, and, and then this is a Lewy body in a cortical neuron. So in the gray matter cortex. Um, and so these were really hard to see. So Dr. Lewy described this in, uh, in the early 1900s. Um, and it wasn't until 19, the late 1960s that Dr. Okasaki described the Lewy bodies in the gray, gray matter, the cortex. Uh, today, we have better tools. We have these antibodies that can stain tissue. So we're much better at recognizing this. Uh, and so when we go back and looking forward, we can try to see, you know, who has symptoms and how are these symptoms related to Lewy body dementia. Uh, so we have buckets of symptoms, as I like to put it. So we have motor symptoms. People move slower. They move stiffer. They have balance problems. They may shake. They have cognition problems, so lots of visual problems, visual attention, visual tracking, visual attention, visual perception. So many people will go to their eye doctor first to try to get their lenses corrected. And of course, the eye doctor can't fix it because it's not their eyes, it's really their brain. Uh, they can have psychiatric or behavioral problems, particularly visual hallucinations, seeing little people or furry animals uh, is a very common type of symptom. Um, and what's really beginning to get known is these sort of constitutional symptoms. So these are symptoms like a loss of smell, constipation, sexual dysfunction, uh, urinary problems. And these things may begin up to two decades uh, before people develop any other symptoms. So we're really learning a lot more about the disease um, and how it's different than Alzheimer's and, and healthy aging. Uh, so again, this is post-mortem or autopsy tissue. Um, so this is the substantia nigra. This means black line or black substance. And this is the seat of dopamine for the brain. This is what helps you move. Uh, and this degenerates in Parkinson's disease. Um, and you can see this is a healthy looking black dark line in a health, uh, person with Alzheimer's and a healthy control, but is degenerated in people with dementia with Lewy bodies. Um, this is the brain. And so this is a hippocampus, this little seahorse shaped thing. So it looks like a seahorse. And this is the seat of your short-term memory. Um, so this is the seahorse or the hippocampus in Lewy body dementia. And this is in a healthy control. And this is a person with Alzheimer's disease. And you can see it's very shrunken and this space is very dilated. Um, so we can use these clues to help us. And in fact, on an MRI, we can see this. We also know that the disease propagates. So the spread of the disease really explains the symptoms. Remember I said there are two types. There's the Parkinson's dementia type and there's the dementia with Lewy body type. And we think this has to do with how the disease spreads throughout the brain. So in Parkinson's disease, it probably starts in the brain stem, the lower part of the brain and spreads up. In Lewy body dementia, it starts in the higher part of the brain and spreads down. And that's why we have different presentations. So again, we're learning so much about the disease. We now have criteria that help us make diagnoses, right? And so this is a paper that we published in 2017 that defined the criteria. So we need a dementia, a change in memory and thinking functions, in particular in attention, executive function that's doing complex tasks and in visual perceptual abilities. These are the tests that really help us. Um, and people have what we call core features. So they have to have at least three of these. 
So fluctuating cognition. So changes in alertness and attention, sort of like turning a switch on and off. So people can stare or have blank looks. They can have recurrent visual hallucinations, seeing things. They can have what's called REM sleep behavior disorder. They act out their dreams. Or they can have signs of Parkinsonism. Or they can have some other features that are less uh, specific for Lewy body dementia. Uh, we can also use biomarkers. So these are laboratory tests. And some of these laboratory tests are really quite helpful. So the, the differences in Lewy body dementia are very different than we see in other dementias. So let me give you an example. So we can use MRIs as a biomarker. So this is a person with Alzheimer's disease, and this is a person with Lewy body dementia. They're roughly the same age, and they have roughly the same severity of dementia. But you can see the hippocampus looks pretty good here, but again, is very shrunken in Alzheimer's disease. So we can use this as a biomarker to help us. We can do a dopamine scan. So this is a, a nuclear medicine scan called a SPEC scan or a DAT scan. Um, and so we can, this is a healthy control and we can see the, uh, the basal ganglia where the dopamine goes to. And it looks like a comma, like a, you know, a punctuation comma. Uh, in Lewy body dementia, we see degeneration or loss of these neurons. So now it looks more like a period. And again, a very specific sign. We don't see this in other diseases. Uh, so we can see it in Parkinson's and Lewy body dementia, but we don't see it in Alzheimer's disease. So a very good biomarker. In, in some countries, we can also do some imaging of the heart. It's called scintography. So this isn't a, a person with Alzheimer's. This is a person with Lewy body dementia, and this is a healthy control. All right, so this is the liver. And inside the circle is the heart shadow. So we can see it in Alzheimer's disease and we can see it in normal controls, but we don't see it in Lewy body dementia. Now, this doesn't mean that Lewy body dementias don't have a heart. It just means that the dopamine innervation to the heart is decreased. We don't do this test much in the United States because we can see these same type of findings in people with diabetes. And diabetes is more common in the US than it is in Western Europe or in Asia. So, they use this more frequently outside the United States, but it can be a useful test. We can also use neuropsychological testing. So these are pencil and paper testing. And we know that people with Lewy body dementia have a different profile of test performance than people with Alzheimer's or other diseases. So don't worry about all these tests, but you can see that the pluses and minuses are different between the different diseases. This means that your doctor, when they look at the performance on a test, can start to use the test to help them make what we call differential diagnosis, discriminating one disease from another. Um, and in particular, we can see that these executive and visual tests are much more pronounced in Lewy body dementia than they are in other diseases. We're getting close, not there yet, but we're getting close to the ability of measuring this in blood as well. So this is data from a company called McHugh in Taiwan, and we're collaborating with them in the United States to do these tests. Um, so we can do blood tests measuring alpha synuclein. This is the protein that causes those Lewy bodies in the brain. And you can see that uh, it's much higher in the blood in Parkinson's disease than in healthy controls. And as Parkinson's becomes more severe, the levels go up. And as the Parkinson patient develops dementia, the levels go up. So we can may be able to use this as a blood test in the future. If we combine this with, say, an Alzheimer blood test, we're even better at differentiating groups into different pockets. So we could potentially use these blood tests to really make early and sophisticated correct diagnoses. What happens to the family? Well, I told you that it takes a long time to make a diagnosis. And when we talked to family members, almost 900 of them, uh, what we found was that 78% of the time, patients were diagnosed with another disease. Um, so sometimes they were diagnosed with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So that, that's not so bad. It's not really wrong. It's not right, but it's not really wrong. But sometimes they're not giving a diagnosis at all, or they're given a primary psychiatric diagnosis and put on medicines that could potentially be harmful. Uh, many patients need to see multiple doctors and wait up to 18 months before they get a diagnosis. Most of the time, the diagnosis is made by a neurologist. The problem is that family caregivers really find it hard to find a physician who's knowledgeable about, Alt about Lewy body dementia and knows how to manage it. Um, and that's a problem. We need to do a better job. 
it's useful to get a diagnosis because we know that Lewy body progresses a little faster and there's more functional disability and the care costs may be higher in Lewy body dementia. So what we need to do is provide an early diagnosis so we can have the correct management, including supporting the patient and the family. What's really exciting now is that we're getting to the point where we can diagnose, potentially diagnose Lewy body dementia before they actually have Lewy body dementia. So that's this sort of prodrome. Um, and so this is a paper that just came out this year that I was privileged to be part of, where we actually were able to define several features that may happen before the disease and allow us to create criteria to look at conditions. So for example, we can look at mild cognitive impairment with Lewy bodies, right? And so we have criteria that help us diagnose this. Or we can look at delirium onset Lewy body dementia. So these are people who don't have any symptoms, but then they get provoked by something. So they go to the hospital and then they have this delirious period. We think that this may be sort of a, a stress test in some ways for the brain and brings out their Lewy body dementia. Uh, and then many people will go on to develop disease. Another is a psychiatric onset disease. In other words, people begin by having these weird thoughts like hallucinations or delusions, false beliefs. And then they later on to go on to develop the disease. Now that we have research criteria, we're able to design research projects to test this. One of the things we need to do that is to create tools to allow us to characterize the disease. This is a tool that I created a number of years ago, which is called the Lewy Body Composite Risk Score. So it's 10 questions, yes, no, <clears throat> can be completed by the patient, the family, or the physician. And you're looking for signs and symptoms. And if there's more than two yeses, then this statistically means I have Lewy bodies because we validated against this, uh, this against an autopsy sample. Um, what we know is when we compare controls and Alzheimer's to patients with Lewy body dementia, controls and Alzheimer's have scores less than two. Patients with Lewy body dementia have high scores, up to six, or maybe up to 10. And even at that mild cognitive impairment, say that prodromal stage, again, MCI due to Alzheimer's, less than two, MCI due to Lewy bodies, three or more. So a very good test. Another tool that's being developed is by Ian McKean's group in England, which is called the Diamond Lewy Toolkit. Now, the tool I just showed you just has eight questions, yes, no, and it's meant to be a screener. This is a much more complex tool. It's six pages long, but it has lots of questions. And so it, it allows a clinician in clinic to sort of check off a bunch of symptoms and potentially help them make a diagnosis. So a very nice toolkit. One of the other things we're doing is for the Alzheimer's Disease Center program, of which Emery is one participant in this program. Um, I had the privilege of chairing a committee to create a module to allow the research centers to make a diagnosis. Um, and this is some data from a paper that's under review where we looked at the module in healthy controls, people with Alzheimer's and people with Lewy body dementia. And there are a number of features in this module that really pick out the people with Lewy body disease so that this module has a potential to be a great diagnostic tool. One of the tests I'll show you is this really neat test. It's called the noise pareidolia test. So it's kind of a modified ink blot test. So we show a person a bunch of pictures. And so this is a picture and we ask them to tell us whether they see a face in this picture. So for everybody looking here, you don't have to raise your hand and I can't see you, face or no face? And the answer is no face. If you saw a face, come see me later. Um, but there's no face in this picture. And then we show them a picture that has a face. And so hopefully you can see that the face up here in this corner. And so we try to see, can the people see there's a face or not? And is the face located in the right place? And what we found is that this test does a great job of discriminating people with Lewy body disease from Alzheimer's and healthy controls. So a 10 minute test has almost a 90% chance of classifying people correctly. What do we do for treatment? Well, right now there are no medicines specifically indicated to treat dementia with Lewy bodies. Uh, so we use off label treatments, right? So we use medicines from other diseases and we can control the cognitive symptoms and the motor symptoms and the fluctuations and the behaviors and the sleep and some of the autonomic or blood pressure problems. We can control all that. We can treat that symptomatically, but we do need to develop new medicines. 
uh, what the Lewy Body Dementia Association and the Research Center of Excellence program, and, and Todd Graham is going to talk about this at the end of the conference a little bit. Um, uh, we've met together to try to figure out how we can design studies. And so we have a paper that's uh, uh, in press right now uh, where we can consider all the things that go into building a clinical trial. Um, and there are a number of trials that are ongoing now, so we're very excited about that. There's also a research center of excellence program. So these are 24 or 25 centers around the country uh, that really specialize and we're forming as a clinical trials network. So to summarize, it's a lot of information in a short period of time as the Lewy body dementias are very common, maybe the most common disease you never heard of. Um, uh, for the present, we largely treat the symptoms, but myself and people around the world, including people at Emory are spearheading novel research to improve clinical practice to include improve our diagnosis, improve the lives of our patients and their family caregivers, and to develop new medicines. I want to thank you for your attention, and I think I have a couple of seconds for a question or two. Uh, Dr. Galvin? Yes. Um, I'm going to kind of forward some of the questions to you. I don't know what you can see in your box or not. Um, you did kind of talk about is this the disease Robin Williams suffered with and other things? Would you be able to make a statement or give us any information on why hearing may be associated with dementia? Is this a feature of Lewy body right. dementia? So, so the, the data is continuing to grow. So, so two things. So one is that if you can't hear, then you're not going to remember things. And if you don't, if you never heard them, you can't remember them. So Hearing loss does worsen people's memory loss and other cognitive symptoms. But there's actually some very interesting research because your ear is not part of your brain, but your inner ear where you actually hear that the, the, the actual mechanism that creates the signals to hear is part of your central nervous system. Um, and so some of the changes that are occurring in the, in the, ear, in the inner ear and also in the retina may reflect changes that are going on in the brain. So we think that they're somehow related, but we don't know exactly what that link is at this point, but it's clear that if you have hearing loss, the risk of developing a dementia is greater. If you have retinal disease, the risk of developing a dementia is greater. Okay. Um, I, um, I'm trying to read the monitor. Any other questions? Do you have any information about minorities, in particular African Americans, and Lewy body disease? So, Lewy body disease is a less studied disease, and so we are attempting to do that. One of the things we sort of sort of see is that Alzheimer's disease is a higher risk in all African Americans. Vascular dementia seems to be a higher risk in African Americans. Parkinson's disease and Lewy body dementia. Uh, does not seem to affect African Americans at quite the same level, but we don't know the reasons why. That may, may do with some risk genes. We know there are risk genes, for example, in African Americans for Alzheimer's disease, and we, we don't know whether those risk genes are, presence, uh, are present for, for Lewy body dementia. So a lot of studies still needs to be done. Thank you. And one other question is sleep. Um, oh. I highly recommend it. Sleep dysfunction. Oh, the other thing, the comment is, um, why is it that people with Lewy body dementia are more likely to have a more rapid decline than people with Alzheimer's? Is there any knowledge about that? So we've studied this and several other groups have studied this. Um, and so part of the reason is that we don't know that and unfortunately that's always an answer. Um, Part of it seems to be that most people, about 80% of people with Lewy body dementia also have concurrent Alzheimer's disease. And so it seems to be that the interaction of the two pathologies actually leads to a faster progression than if you just had one pathology. Um, and, and so two bad things are worse for your brain than one bad thing. Um, and so that's what we think may be the main reason uh, for the more rapid progression. Um, is that really is two diseases going on. Um, 
Thank you very much, Dr. Galvin. And at this time, we don't have any more time for questions for Dr. Galvin. We need to move on with the program to honor all of our time. Our next presenter is going to be Dr. Robert Stern from Boston University. He's professor of neurology, neurosurgery, anatomy and neurobiology, and has been the director of the um, clinical, uh, clinical research in Boston University CTE Center. Um, at this time, I'd like to hear from Dr. Robert Stern. Making sure you can hear me. And <clears throat> just going to share my screen. All right. Well, first of all, uh, thank you so very much, Dr. Parker, for inviting me. Um, it's a real honor to be part of this. Uh, it's uh, terrific to um, be able to participate with uh, some of my colleagues, but more importantly, it's uh, always an incredible uh, treat for me and honor uh, for me to be able to speak to a, a large group like this um, and to make sure that we all kind of can grow with our understanding of these very complex diseases. And I uh, really applaud uh, everything that's been going on at your center for outreach and education. Um, it's really quite unique. So um, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to uh, start with this. Yeah, so that's an interesting sport. Um, the goal is to induce a brain injury. It's interesting if you if you haven't put it that way. That's that's pretty interesting. Um, we have known now for about a hundred years uh, that getting your head hit over and over again from boxing can lead to long-term neurological problems, including dementia. So way back in 1928. Um, in the Amer Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, there was a paper called Punch Drunk, and it described the long-term consequences of getting your head hit in boxing uh, in such wonderful um, medical and scientific terms as uh, being goofy and slug nutty. But actually then it said later on, um, many of these former boxers would require, quote, institutionalization in an asylum for dementia. Soon thereafter, the term dementia pugilistica was used, the dementia of pugilists, of boxers. And then it's been since the 1940s and 50s that a more general term, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, has been used. What CTE is, it's the same thing as dementia pugilistica. It's a neurodegenerative disease similar to Alzheimer's disease and similar in many ways to all of the diseases we're talking about today. But it's a unique disease. There's been lots of work now at the very, very molecular level looking at the proteins involved with special molecular techniques. And you can see that it's a little bit different from Alzheimer's disease, a little bit different from uh, uh, cortical basal degeneration and uh, all these other types of diseases that involve an abnormal um, uh, amount of uh, the, the protein called tau. And CTE is associated with a history of these repetitive head impacts these repetitive blows that can in lead to concussions, which are symptomatic, meaning you get your head hit, there's some kind of mild trauma to the brain and there's symptoms that go along with it right away, but also subconcussive trauma. And I'm gonna talk about that more in a little bit. And so the disease 
starts during the time of exposure to these repetitive hits. And then it sets in motion a cascade of changes in the brain, including the buildup of this abnormal form of tau protein, which continues to spread after the head impacts stop. So you heard earlier um, about uh, Alzheimer's disease changes in the brain starting around 20 years before the very first symptoms. In this case, it's the same kind of thing. With this disease of CTE, the changes in the brain begin years or decades often before there's any changes to the person's functioning. And that abnormal tau protein slowly but surely hurts the way the brain cells function, eventually destroying brain cells, resulting in atrophy. Very similar to what happens in Alzheimer's disease, but in a different direction. The changes start in a different area of the brain and then progress in a kind of backwards uh, order from that of Alzheimer's disease. And it's only the tau protein that seems to be involved early on in this disease and not the abnormal amyloid protein that results in the plaques that you hear of with Alzheimer's. And as I said, often there can be a delay of years or decades before the end of repetitive head impact exposure and symptoms. And as more and more brain tissue becomes hurt, there are more and more symptoms, depending upon which parts of the brain are involved. And I mentioned before this subconcussive trauma. So one of the things that's been spoken about already today is the idea that a brain injury, a traumatic brain injury can lead to later life dementia. That's been the focus of a variety of types of research studies, and we still don't know the actual relationship between a single moderate to severe traumatic brain injury and later life cognitive decline. Initially, some of the research suggested it was a risk for Alzheimer's disease. That doesn't seem to be it. There's also some data suggesting that it's a risk for Parkinson's disease, but that doesn't seem to be consistent as well. But some people who had a single traumatic brain injury might be at increased risk for some type of cognitive decline later in life. But that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about more of these mild brain injuries and especially the repetitive ones. We hear a lot about concussion, which as I said, is a mild traumatic brain injury that results in some symptoms. Right now, the research does not indicate that just having one concussion or even multiple concussions increases the risk for this disease, CTE. So what's subconcussive trauma? It's when you have a blow to the head that results in some very mild brain injury, but at the time without any symptoms. And it's this cumulative amount of repetitive subconcussive trauma that appears to lead to CTE. And so up here you have the very tip of that proverbial iceberg having a moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. Not very common. When it happens though, it's a very big deal. And it might lead later on to some kind of cognitive decline. Nowadays, we all hear about concussion and you know the concussion protocols and the concussion settlements, and everyone's talking about concussion, which is really important because concussions are very important to understand and to detect and to um, make sure that people are um, treated appropriately. However, that just scratches the surface. What seems to be the bigger culprit is all of the trauma that can occur under the water, meaning that huge part under the water of that iceberg, and we would call that subconcussive trauma. Think of linemen in football. Imagine every play of every practice and every game, these guys are hitting their heads against each other. And yeah, that helmet makes it so they don't feel the pain Imagine what it would be if you were 300 pounder hitting another 300 pounder head to head like that. That would really hurt. But if you have the helmet on, 
it doesn't hurt. But the brain still moves rapidly back and forth inside that skull. And it's that rapid change and the stretching and shearing of the brain cells that seem to alter the, the integrity of the cells and the chemicals that are released, the integrity of the blood vessels around the cells. That seems to be what is at the root of chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Dr. Galvin showed some famous people who had dementia with Lewy bodies. Here's just a, a small kind of number of the people who you may know. Some pretty famous American football players who after death, several at a relatively young age, were found to have this disease diagnosed after death through a brain uh, a neuropathological examination, they were found to have CTE. John Mackey, Ali Matson, both of these guys had pretty significant dementia later in life. You've heard about Aaron Hernandez. Andre Waters was one of the first cases of an American football player to have died and then was found to have this disease. Dave Duerson, I'm gonna speak about in a minute. Bubba Smith had CTE. Think about all these guys, but this is just a tiny fraction of a lot of American football players who you may have heard of and many more that you haven't. Dave Duerson tragically died at the age of 50. I'm gonna give you him as an example of what happened and what his symptoms were. So Dave Duerson was um, a very famous uh, Chicago Bear. Uh, he played on the Bears the last time they went to the Super Bowl, which I think was maybe 500 years ago, it seems. Um, but uh, no, he, he was a, a very successful uh, player. And then after he retired from the NFL, he was also a successful business person. But starting at the age of 45, so for around five years prior to his death, he had worsening short-term memory and other cognitive difficulties. And at the same time, he became more and more out of control. His family members and others around him described him as having a short fuse. He was hot-tempered. Sadly, he became physically abusive and verbally abusive. All of this meant that he lost his business and a very successful business it was. And more importantly, he also lost his marriage because of physical abuse. And then one night he took his own life by shooting himself in the chest in order to avoid hurting his brain so he could have his brain sent to our uh, brain bank at, at Boston University. And my colleague, Dr. Ann McKee, uh, studied uh, Dave Duerson's brain and lo and behold, just at the age of 50, he had very significant disease, especially for that age. And all the brown stuff is after a stain is put on the brain tissue showing that abnormal amount of tau. I'm not gonna get into the details about it, but boy, at the age of 50 for him to have um, had this amount of disease and very strikingly uh, the, meeting the, the clear diagnosis of CTE. But what are those clinical features associated with this underlying change in tau? We, I've got to tell you, we don't know for sure. This is a relatively newly studied disease. So we're just learning. But one thing that we see over and over again is that there's a change in emotional and behavioral control. So there's agitation and rage and having a short fuse and impulse control problems and aggression. We refer to this now as neurobehavioral dysregulation. And what we see is that it often starts relatively young in age in around 30s, 40s, 50s. And then there's changes in cognitive functioning where there is the 
short-term memory problems, the same type of difficulty that we see in Alzheimer's disease, that same hippocampus that you heard about from Dr. Galvin, it seems to be hurt and the person has the inability to make new memories. And so they forget things rapidly and they repeat things over and over again. And then there's also what's called executive functioning problems, problems with judgment and decision-making, impaired organization and problem-solving skills, the inability to do more than one task at a time. And there can be other cognitive changes as well. And what we've seen is that often the cognitive difficulties start a little bit later in life, maybe starting in one's 50s, 60s, 70s. And then as someone lives long enough, those cognitive changes get worse and worse and have an impact on daily functioning, as you heard Dr. Parker describe, meaning the person has dementia. But in this case, it's dementia from CTE. It's not Alzheimer's disease. Remember, dementia is more of the later stage of all of these neurodegenerative diseases when enough brain tissue is hurt and the symptoms become severe enough to get in the way of daily functioning and independence, that's when they would be considered to have dementia. In this case, the cause of dementia is this chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And what we've seen is that it can be very difficult to differentiate while someone's alive just by having a clinical examination. The cognitive changes in Alzheimer's disease from those seen in CTE. Dr. Galvin mentioned caregiving earlier with Lewy body disease. The same thing with CTE. Being a caregiver for someone with CTE can be one of the most difficult of life's journeys. Like all these other neurodegenerative diseases, it's an invisible disability. And so it's hard for others around you to understand what's going on. But in this case for CTE, we don't have a diagnosis during life yet. And oftentimes people are finding that clinicians are not that educated about CTE yet. And so there isn't an understanding when someone goes to the doctor. But oftentimes these are younger men. Oftentimes they are large and strong. And therefore there can be safety concerns for family and even professional caregivers. And because some of the changes can occur during productive years, younger years, when there are kids and the need for taking care of children, as well as being productive through work, that can have a dramatic impact on not just the individual, but the family as well. And some problems from CT can sadly lead to an exacerbation of the abuse of alcohol and other substances and perhaps make recovery more difficult and relapse more likely. You know, if people now think about CTE predominantly in former professional football players, or now you know it's also the same thing that happened in boxers. But the brain doesn't know what's hitting it. And so CT has now been diagnosed, at least in post-mortem examinations in people who just played up through college, people who just played up through high school levels of football. It's been found in former soccer players, both professional and semi-pro soccer players. It's been found in former ice hockey players, including pros and semi-pros, but it's also been seen in rugby players, some cases down in Australia. It's also been seen in military veterans who were exposed to blast trauma, especially during these uh, last couple decades. The only women so far that it's been diagnosed in after death um, uh, were just these two. It, one was a developmentally disordered um, uh, chronic headbanger, um, repeatedly hurting her, her, her brain that way. The other was a victim of many, many years of repetitive brain trauma from domestic violence. And later in life, she had significant dementia. So right now, um, 
we can't yet confirm the diagnosis of CT during life. It's a neuropathological diagnosis. So my colleague like Dr. McKee and others look at the brain tissue under a microscope and they can um, detect and diagnose this disease and, and clarify that it's CT and not another type of neuropathological diagnosis. But there now, just right now are beginning to be diagnostic criteria for what we refer to as traumatic encephalopathy syndrome or TES, which we're using to describe the clinical features associated with the underlying CTE brain pathology. So CTE is the brain disease, the changes in the brain, but while someone's alive, the description of what's going on, uh, the term now used is traumatic encephalopathy syndrome. And so we're just starting to do a lot of research on these new criteria. I've been very um, honored to be uh, one of the people leading um, the, uh, the work, um, uh, coming up with a consensus of many experts from around the country about uh, these criteria. But similar to Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative disorders, um, we're going to need these objective biological tests, biomarkers, in addition to a good clinical evaluation that could eventually together lead to accurate early detection and diagnosis of CT during life. The same thing that you've been hearing from uh, Dr. Galvin and from Dr. Parker. And so having a, um, uh, an assessment of someone's cognitive functioning but then also this kind of objective biomarker, in this case, it's a PET scan with all the red here is showing abnormal amounts of amyloid plaque in someone with Alzheimer's disease during life. So maybe together we can use this type of approach to come up with a good diagnosis of CTE during life as well. So the question is, can we see that abnormal tau of CTE in the brain during life? And so maybe we could use PET scans to do that. So I just mentioned there's this, the um, uh, FDA approved PET scans for the amyloid plaques in Alzheimer's disease. And these have been around now for several years and they're very, very good at detecting the abnormal changes of, of amyloid protein in people with Alzheimer's disease. But in CTE, these amyloid plaques are actually very uncommon until very late stage in the disease when there's these multiple um, conditions going on like you've heard about uh, earlier where the people don't just have one disease, they have several. But earlier on, fluorbetapyr, which is the most common of these amyloid PET scans, might not be expected to be elevated in CTE. So are there scans that can detect the abnormal tau? Oh well, yeah, over the last several years, there's been work on new types of PET scan approaches that can detect the abnormal tau, initially in Alzheimer's disease, and actually the one I'm gonna show you was just approved by the FDA for use in Alzheimer's disease. But would it be appropriate for the detection and diagnosis of the tau changes in chronic traumatic encephalopathy? Now, I, uh, I show this just because I'm so proud that uh, I was able to um, have a New England Journal of Medicine uh, article uh, that's always you know, very cool for a researcher. And so in this case, we use that, um, flor that flortausapir, the tau PET scan, and we were able to detect abnormal amounts of um, the the buildup of the tau using this tau PET scan during life and in the places that we would have expected it to be in CTE. And in fact, when we looked at the number of years playing football, because this was a study of former NFL players, when we looked at the number of years playing football and we uh, examined whether it was related to the amount of the abnormal tau protein in the brain during life we, that we could detect with the PET scan, we found a pretty striking relationship. The more football played, the more abnormal tau in the brain.
And so I won't go into all the details because I want to be able to close up quickly, but we've done a whole lot of research and people from around the world have been doing research just in the last several years, looking at a variety of what these fluid biomarkers, so like what you heard from um, uh, Dr. Galvin, looking at blood tests, as well as tests from spinal fluid, and a variety of neuroimaging biomarkers, not just the PET scans, but also the um, advanced type of MRI scans. And so we now have some potential CTE biomarkers. And so I'm really um, uh, incredibly uh, uh, humbled to be able to be leading a, a large study funded by the National Institutes of Health called the Diagnose CTE Research Project. That's actually a, an acronym um, that uh, is really, really long, and I can never remember what the acronym stands for. But um, it's a, a study that I have uh, some absolutely wonderful colleagues as my uh, co-leaders, investigators of this, plus we have around 30 researchers from around the country, um, from 10 different research institutions. And we have been studying a group of 240 men, ages 45 to 74. Um, 120 of them uh, were former NFL players, 60 were former college players, and 60 uh, were um, controls, meaning uh, same age guys who never had their head hit repeatedly or had a history of traumatic brain injury. And they would come to one of four sites around the country and we do all kinds of examinations, testing their cognitive functioning, their behavior, their movement, neurological uh, examinations. And we got lots of um, spinal fluid and blood and saliva and had MRI scans and PET scans and then diagnosed them with these, this new diagnostic to criteria. And the idea was to have everyone have a baseline evaluation and then see them back again three years later. Well, um, after three years of, of work uh, getting the baseline of examinations, we actually completed them on February 26th. Now think about when the pandemic started. And right after that, uh, we would not be able to fly these older individuals all around the country to one of our sites to be evaluated due to the risks from COVID. And so timing is everything. So now we have all of the, the baseline data from these 240 individuals. Hopefully we're gonna have a lot of important findings from that study. Um, and studies from other centers as well that will allow us to diagnose CTE during life. Um, just like now, there's much, much better ability to diagnose Alzheimer's disease very accurately during life or dementia with Lewy bodies during life. And if we can do that, we'll be able to begin clinical trials for treatment. And if we can detect it early enough, prior to any symptoms, we might be able to then conduct clinical trials for prevention of those symptoms in the first place. But if that doesn't work, maybe we could just learn from our animal friends. If you can't read it on the bottom, it says, I read that story about dementia and former NFL players. Maybe we should reconsider this. So with that, I just want to um, remind everyone to please, please, Stay safe and thank you very much. Oh, Dr. Stern, thank you so much. Um, right this moment, uh, Dr. Benimer does have to catch a plane. So with your forbearance, we'd like to move on to the Dr. Benimer's presentation. Is that okay with you? Sure thing. Thank you, Dr. Benimer. Thank you. Um... Dr. Parker, let me share my screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Hello? Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Um, so thank you for inviting me. My name is Dr. Ben Amer. I am a neurologist at um, Emory, uh, part of the Emory Brain Health Center. And um, Dr. Parker asked me to give a talk about vascular dementia and stroke. 
Uh, my passion is actually um, in, in nutrition and neurological diseases. Um, and so um, being in the Southeast and in Georgia, uh, we have a lot of vascular um, risk factors and vascular disease and stroke. And um, I'll, I'll be talking about that aspect of things. Um, okay, so as you have heard earlier, dementia is an umbrella uh, term. Um, it just means cognitive impairment. Um, and it, the most common cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. Um, vascular dementia and Lewy body dementia come very close um, after that. Um, and it really depends on which geographical area you're talking about. So here for us, we have a lot more vascular dementia. Um, and then you have some other types of dementia um, like fr frontotemporal. Um, Vascular dementia, the hallmark of the disease is that it is a disease that is characterized by diseased vessels. And it's the diseased vessels that drive the, the, the pathology that we see in the brain. Um, and so it can be due to small vessel disease, which is the tiny little hairs in the brain that are the size of a, a tiny little um, blood vessels that are the size of a hair um, that we actually can't see on MRI. You can actually also have um, plaques and atherosclerosis in the large vessels. So in the carotids and the large vessels that we can't image, the ones that are actually seen um, on this picture. Um, and the vascular dementia um, or vascular, vascular cognitive decline, you can see multiple types. You can see um, cognitive de decline after stroke and actually more than 60% of people that have a stroke have cognitive decline after it. Um, and then you can have vascular dementia where you have multiple little hits over time, which cause uh, brain dysfunction and brain atrophy. Um, and when I say that there are different types of dementia and that vascular dementia is more of a vessel disease type of dementia, these are often categories of diseases that um, have uh, that, that crosstalk. So Alzheimer's disease also um, is a disease that you see more commonly in people that have diabetes and vascular risk factors. In vascular dementia, you can also see changes that you can see in Alzheimer's disease. But what is important to know is that there is, it's kind of, um, there is an intersection between the two diseases. Um, and that what drives them is mainly what we call in medicine vascular risk factors. And so um, when I talk about vascular risk factors, what I'm trying to get to is the root cause of the problem, right? So if you have, for example, um, a bacterial infection in your chest and your lungs, um, your symptoms would be fever and cough and shortness of breath. If we treat your cough only with a cough suppressant like Robitussin, we did not actually treat the root cause of the problem, which is the bacterial infection. And so we can treat the cough all we want, but unless we get to the root cause of what's causing that symptoms, we will not be able to help that. And so the same thing happens for stroke and vascular uh, cognitive impairment. The root causes are the vascular risk factors, which are most commonly known as diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, um, um, smoking and poor quality diet and being physically inactive. But what's interesting is that diving even deeper is that the poor quality diet and the physical act inactivity in and of themselves feed the vascular risk factors of diabetes and hypertension. So they are independent risk factors, plus they worsen the risk factors of diabetes, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. And so it's very important to address these root causes which call uh, which cause what we call the metabolic syndrome to try to get to what is causing the symptoms of cognitive impairment. Um, and so I will turn your attention a little bit to um, um, the diet part of it. Um, as I said, my passion is about nutrition and neurological diseases. And in this, um, in this talk, I will try to tie together the nutrition as a, part, as a modifiable risk factor and as a risk factor for vascular risk factors. So if you see here in my slide, um, on the left, um, you can see it, this is a, a slide from the CDC from the NHANES study. Um, and on the y-axis, you have the percentage um, of calories in a meal and, um, and um, um, in the x-axis, you have the survey done uh, every few years. So they would survey people every four years and they followed them for more than 25 years. And as you can see, the amount of protein that people have consumed in the US has not changed much. 
Um, however, the amount of carbohydrates has gone up and the amount of fat has gone down. And that happened around 1977, which happened to coincide with the first US food pyramid uh, that came out after the McGovern report, where we were told to base our plate with um, starches and then vegetables. And then um, you had at the very top sweets and, and fats and you were not supposed to um, overdo it with the fats and cholesterol is not good for you. And so you had people eating you know, fat-free cookies and fat-free Twinkies because they were fat-free and they thought that they were eating healthy. And the truth is that when, when we were told to base our food pyramid with carbohydrates, what increased is mainly the sugar and the the processed cereals, it was not the carbohydrates that you see in beans and pulses and vegetables. And so that caused an epidemic of diabetes and obesity. And so if you see here, these are the years from the 1960s until 1996. And I, the, the, I don't have the, 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 the most recent data, but you can see the carbohydrate intake, how it took off here right after the food pyramid. And you can see how the, the, the um, obesity epidemic took off right after the food pyramid. So, you know, um, the, the CDC and the USDA came out with the recommendations and, and folks listened. They did follow those recommendations, but it had an unintended consequence of um, causing, you know, uh, an explosion of metabolic syndrome. And so if you see here on the map, um, the rates of diabetes in the 1990s compared to now, the redder, the worse, and the more prevalent um, obesity and diabetes. And with that followed the, the, the maps of uh, things that come from diabetes and obesity followed. So things like stroke, um, this is a map of stroke and uh, 2017, I believe is the latest. Um, we in Georgia are right here, um, right in the buckle of the what they call the stroke belt. So this dark purple is the stroke belt. This is where we have a lot of vascular disease strokes and um, we are right in, in, the, in the midst of it. Um, and so you might be wondering, okay, well, uh, you're talking about diet and I need to eat healthy, but what do I do? I keep trying to eat healthy and then I, and then I do well for a few months and, or a few weeks and then I fall behind and then I get back on the saddle. And it's true. It's true that it's very hard to change behavior. It's very hard to lose weight. Uh, but what you want to do is you want to make your biology work for you rather than work against you. Um, because if you just rely on motivation, nobody has unlimited motivation. And so you can be eating, you know, green beans and uh, chicken breast today for a month, and then you're going to get sick of it and you'll want what you usually eat and what you usually grew up with. And so what we want is we want to make our biology work for us. And so this is a very complex slide showing um, the interaction between the brain the reward centers in the brain, the feeding centers in the brain, the hunger and satiety centers with their hormones as they are secreted in our gut after we eat. Um, and so when we eat uh, a meal that causes our insulin to go up because um, insulin is what drives the sugar inside the cells for the, the cells to consume it. Our ghrelin goes up um, and um, our uh, GLP-1 goes down and there is, a, there is a feedback loop that happens between the brain and the stomach to where, where it tells you when you're full, when to stop. Um, and a lot of times when people are eating the regular, what's called the SAD diet or the standard American diet, that diet is very highly processed. Um, and so the processing of the food plus the mix of the right amount of fat and carbs hijacks those obesity centers in the brain and makes you not know when to stop until you feel too full and you feel too sick to your stomach. Um, or um, so the calorie density has an effect on that, the portion size, what you are eating, the breakdown of, of fat and carbohydrates, all of that has, a, has an effect. And so um, here is an example of a trial that was done where they had people um, given uh, randomized to a, a sad diet. So the, you know, the, your regular standard American diet and then an unprocessed diet. And they gave them unlimited access to the food and they just observed how many calories they ate and, and their weight. And they followed them for a few weeks. And as you can see, so the blue is people who were eating ultra processed food like burgers and, you know, um, um, 
hot dogs and things like that. And the unprocessed food is the red line. And so if you notice, um, the people who are eating ultra processed food from the get go eat a higher amount of calories. So they start at 3000 calories per day, whereas people who are eating unprocessed food eat less calories to start with. Not only that, the body weight for, so, and, and these were people that were not limited in their intake of food, people that ate unprocessed food without actually trying to eat less lost weight. Um, and people who were eating ultra processed food, your standard American diet gained weight. So that shows you the effect of processed food on your hunger centers and your satiety centers. And um, this is um, a trial, I'm actually missing the, um, the, the source here, but this was um, published in Neurology um, a couple years ago where they compared, they did PET scans and they compared, um, they randomized people to eating a standard American diet or a Mediterranean diet. And then they scanned their brains. They followed them um, and they scanned people who are most um, consistent um, with staying on the Mediterranean diet and people who were not, or people who were eating standard American diet. And as you can see, these are actually people who are between the ages of 30s and 60s, and they took people who were cognitively intact. Um, and you can see that you can already see changes in brain imaging without people actually having any symptoms of cognitive decline. So the changes, just as my colleagues were saying before, happen 20 years before you start having symptoms. Um, and so you might say, okay, well, what's a Mediterranean diet, right? So, um, you know, I work at Emory Midtown, 85% um, of my population, patient population are African-Americans and I cannot and should not expect somebody in Atlanta to eat like somebody in Athens, Greece, for example. So the Mediterranean diet is a, a, a diet that was, it was observed that people around the Mediterranean and it was mainly Greece and Southern Italy, those people did not have much heart disease, strokes, dementias. And the reason for that they thought was it was because of their diet. Um, and the Mediterranean diet is a diet that is very rich in fruits and vegetables, um, in, um, in seafood and nuts and seeds, um, and very little sugar or processed food. Well, after that, after the Mediterranean diet has been, was done and studied, um, there are many other um, diets that have been looked at um, depending on different parts of the world and how, and how they eat, right? So uh, you have the Nordic diet for patients who are in Scandinavian countries. You have the DASH diet and the MIND diet, which were uh, designed in the US and the DASH diet was initially designed to treat hypertension. Um, and then you have the traditional Asian diet. And as you can see, the, the main component in all these diets is that you want to eat mostly colorful, um, real food, unprocessed. Um, you don't have to necessarily be a vegan for you to be healthy. And so for example, if I were to compare what one of my typical patients would eat, um, you, they would eat a plate that's what's looking then uh, the one that you're seeing on the left. If you wanted to educate them about how to decrease the risk of hypertension, diabetes, stroke, cognitive impairment, you would educate them to modify their plate to look like the one on the right. So instead of frying the chicken, you wanna bake it. You don't necessarily have to go vegan and not eat chicken. You can eat your chicken, but just cook it healthier with healthier oils. You want to use mainly olive oil and you want to go down on the processed food like mac and cheese and rice and breads um, and replace those with healthy starches. So you have a sweet potato there and then you have your, you can have your collard greens, your green beans, all greens are good. Um, and so this is what I have been doing with my patients at Emory McTown. We started a trial for patients who come in with stroke and we have been educating them on what we call the African Heritage Mediterranean Diet. Um, and we worked with a company to design um, books with four weeks of recipes and menus, um, as well as um, leaflets showing what an African heritage, heritage Mediterranean diet would look like. And it would look like this plate on the right. And that's much more sustainable for somebody who grew up on this kind of food. Um, and so um, this is kind of the, uh, how you want to think of your plate. You want it to have half non-starchy carbohydrates. So um, your healthy vegetables, you can have your fruits, you don't have to go on a ketogenic diet. Um, and then you want to have healthy lean protein. As far as drink, you want to li limit your drinks to water much better. Um, and um, 
eat nuts and seeds and be very active. And what I tell my colleagues um, is to always be culturally cognizant when you're um, counseling folks on their food because food is part of our culture. It's part of who we are. It's how we celebrate. Um, and so we, nobody can le live on you know, a lean uh, boiled um, steak and, and broccoli all their lives. And that's what I had for today. I try to really stay within my time frame, um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, you can also email me at karima.benamer at emory.edu. Thank you. In the interest of time, uh, we're going to just keep moving. Uh, Dr. Benamer, Dr. Stern, Dr. Galvin, um, if you can just answer the questions that are appropriate to you in the chat, that would be helpful. Um, we're going to have Dr. Higginbotham come and do her presentation on Parkinsonism. For those of you, since we are all at home, if you have to get up and stretch, get a uh, take a rest break, please do so. But we're in the interest of time, we're going to keep moving along with our program. So at this time, I'd like to bring Dr. Lenora Higginbotham okay. to discuss Parkinson's disease and Parkinson's okay. syndrome. Thank you. I have everything. All right, bye. second while I find my slides are coming up. Okay. Okay. And it's, it's in presenting mode. Oh, okay. Yeah, I see it. Should I begin? Okay, perfect. Um, hi, I am Dr. Higginbotham. I am a neurologist in the Movement Disorders Division at the Emory Brain Health Center. And I'm excited today to talk to you a little bit about Parkinson's disease, dementia. And, um, before I jump into Parkinson's disease dementia, I first wanted to take a step back and reintroduce the concept of the Lewy body dementias. Uh, you heard Dr. Galvin give an excellent introduction to this concept earlier this morning, but the Lewy body dementias um, really refer to two different types of diseases that includes Parkinson's disease dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies. And these two diseases are actually very biologically and clinically very similar. And one of their main um, similarities is that they both feature the abnormal accumulation of the protein alpha-synuclein in the brain in the form of Lewy bodies. Um, and you saw some very nice brain um, neuropathological staining um, earlier in the hour of Lewy bodies, but in case you're not uh, used to looking at the brain, I have a cartoon here. Um, and this is a cartoon of a neuron and the neuron features a cell body and um, protrusions off on the edges called dendrites that uh, mediate uh, information gathering and signaling. There's a command center in the cell body called the nucleus. And in that cell body, you have these accumulations in Lewy body disease, uh, dementias that should not be there. Um, and these Lewy bodies are rich in alpha-synuclein. Now, again, these two diseases both feature Lewy bodies, but um, the Lewy bodies actually progress and uh, proceed through the brain in different ways in these two disorders. And um, this uh, manifest uh, and different onset of cognitive decline relative to motor symptoms. And clinically, this is the main distinguishing factor between Parkinson's disease dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies is when did you get motor symptoms and when did you get cognitive decline? So if you think you're dealing with a Lewy body dementia, the main thing to ask yourself, is there a long motor syndrome preceding the cognitive decline? If the answer is yes, um, you're more towards the Parkinson's disease dementia spectrum. If the answer is no, you are likely more so dealing with dementia with Lewy bodies. And I'm talking about dementia with Lewy bodies. Cognitive decline will be 
very pronounced really early on. We're talking in the first year or at most couple of years of disease. You may even have the cognitive decline preceding the motor symptoms, but this is not the case and in fact is very different in Parkinson's disease dementia. So when I talk about a long motor syndrome, what is long? So on the order of decades, so a decade plus is what we're talking about of motor symptoms prior to significant cognitive decline. And um, the timeline here, um, when we talk about the motor syndrome that you develop, it's a motor syndrome that is very consistent with Parkinson's disease. And again, I'm gonna spend more time talking about Parkinson's disease dementia, but um, of course we, we have to spend a little bit of time on Parkinson's disease. So the classic presentation of Parkinson's disease is a motor syndrome, an asymmetric one um, of bradykinesia or slowed movement, rigidity or stiffness of limbs, plus or minus rest tremor. And that's key. When we think of rest tremor or a tremor that people get when they're just laying around or not doing anything, we think of that as a key feature of Parkinson's disease, but it does not have to be present. In fact, in up to a third of patients with Parkinson's disease, there is no tremor. Okay, so just remember that bradykinesia and rigidity are very key findings, plus or minus the rest tremor. And then almost immediately, or at least maybe within a few years, um, people with classic Parkinson's disease are started on levodopa. Why? Because Parkinson's disease in its diagnostic criteria, you have the fact that this disease is levodopa or, or responsive or responsive to dopamine replacement therapy. So again, Parkinson's disease, you have Lewy bodies at this point accumulating in the substantia nigra in the brainstem causing a motor syndrome and they're just basically deteriorating dopamine neurons. So what we're doing is giving you back dopamine. And then there's also mimics of dopamine replacement therapy such as surgeries, as deep brain stimulation. And the reason why I put this up there again is because in Parkinson's disease, there's different types of Parkinsonism, okay? But Parkinson's disease is classically necessarily responsive to levodopa. And this just highlights that people with Parkinson's disease can go years, decades, doing really, really well having a really great quality of life um, with these medications and these surgical options. However, at some point, usually in the course of Parkinson's disease, and again, I'm talking years and often decade plus, um, our individuals with Parkinson's disease will start developing symptoms that are not really responsive to dopamine replacement therapy. Um, this can include it can include balance issues. Um, this can include autonomic symptoms um, such as orthostasis and um, low blood pressure. But one of the themes of today is cognitive decline. And cognitive decline in Parkinson's disease, dementia or Parkinson's disease is unfortunately not responsive to levodopa. So ultimately if significant cognitive decline develops, dementia, dementia usually often ensues. And again, we are talking, you know, a really long motor prodrome prior to the onset of this Parkinson's disease dementia. And I can't hammer this home enough, okay? This is the core diagnostic criteria for Parkinson's disease dementia. And if you look at the core features, you have to have a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease first. So Parkinson's disease is your biggest risk factor for developing Parkinson's disease dementia. Um, what are some other risk factors? Well, I, Dr. Galvin um, mentioned some of these earlier today. Not, I want to make it clear, not everybody with Parkinson's disease will go on to develop Parkinson's disease dementia. Yes, dementia is much more common in Parkinson's disease relative to the um, rest of the population. Yes, there is a considerable amount, probably say most of people who lived with Parkinson's disease for 20 years will have some degree of significant cognitive decline. But again, just because you have Parkinson's disease does not necessarily mean you're gonna have dementia. So what is the biggest risk factor? Age, as in everything else. If you 
are older with Parkinson's disease, you are more at risk for developing dementia. If you've another risk factor, if you've lived with the disease longer, so that goes hand in hand. So the longer you've had Parkinson's disease, the greater risk you are for dementia. Um, our young onset Parkinson's disease patients. Um, so Parkinson's disease can, the average age is 65, but you know, Michael J. Fox got it when he was 28 or 29, right? So, um, and we, so we have patients who are under the age of 50, under the age of 45, developing this disease. Well, when you look at them 20 years out, they are still very much cognitively intact, okay? So um, the older you are, the older you are when you get this disease, just like anything else, the greater the risk of dementia. Males with Parkinson's disease have a slightly greater risk of dementia than females. Um, certain types of motor function loss. So if you have more tremor predominant, in theory, you are at a lower risk of getting dementia than somebody with more stiffness and more rigidity as their main problem. Okay. So again, there are differences in the rates that people with Parkinson's disease develop cognitive decline and dementia. Um, so if you do develop significant cognitive decline and dementia as part of your Parkinson's disease, well, what does it look like? Um, a lot of patients, when they think of dementia, the first thing they think about um, is you know, somebody who's completely oblivious and not recognizing their family members, somebody who's completely, um, you know, lost all touch with um, reality and really has no memory. So memory is this thing that we really focus on in dementia. But as so many other people pointed out in today's talks, that dementia can affect a ton of other aspects of, of cognition and does not have to be focused on memory. And in fact, in Parkinson's disease dementia, as you saw earlier, you know, Alzheimer's affects the hippocampus and the hippocampus is one of your primary memory centers. But you saw Dr. Galvin point out earlier that in the Lewy body dementias, your hippocampi can be intact, right? So in general, memory loss may not be the main presenting complaint of Parkinson's disease dementia. In fact, other aspects of cognitive decline can be much more prominent. And what are those other aspects? So we already mentioned them, inattention, so inability to focus, concentrate, losing your train of thought, executive dysfunction. This is a big one in the Lewy body dementias, Parkinson's disease dementia in particular. So um, an inability to do a lot of complex things at once or in order, planning, problem solving, time management, all these things. Visual spatial dysfunction is another one, navigation problems. And then um, what tends to characterize both Parkinson's disease dementia and dementia with Lewy bodies more so than some other dementias, um, particularly Alzheimer's, at least early on, is neuropsychiatric deterioration. So hallucinations, delusions, apathy, anxiety, these can all be huge factors in the Lewy body dementias. And so your early um, complaints in Parkinson's disease dementia may look a little bit different from just short-term memory loss. So people may complain of easily losing the thread of conversations, problem with multitasking, organizing, planning, just these other things that I mentioned, difficulty switching tasks, okay? Um, getting lost occasionally while driving. Um, um, and then visual hallucinations is usually, you know, in Parkinson's disease, a sign that you may be going on to develop more significant cognitive decline. And I want to make a really important point here, um, which is that, um, again, what we think is happening in Parkinson's disease is that the Lewy bodies are spreading, right? That's why you get this progression from the midbrain and the substantia nigra through limbic centers and then finally into the cortex. And then once they get into the cortex is when you get significant cognitive decline. However, even when you have basal ganglia centers, those are the ones where we're talking about in the striatum like early on, okay? Those basal ganglia centers that are accumulating Lewy bodies, even in just the motor phase of disease, also mediate some cognitive functions. <laughs> so I tell um, my patients with Parkinson's disease, Okay, especially high powered ones that are working. Okay, and they might report difficulty multitasking early on. 
right? Um, this is not a surefire sign that you're necessarily going to develop dementia tomorrow <laughs> because at, to a certain degree, the basal ganglia centers mediate some of these cognitive functions as well. So there are things that our Parkinson's disease patients cognitively struggle with throughout the course of disease, you know, for years and years and years that do not necessarily get worse before the onset of their significant cognitive decline. And these are things like mild difficulties with multitasking. They're usually more pronounced for my younger patients who are working and have high, high power jobs, or they might have more tip of the tongue phenomenon like this, where they can think of a word, they can't think of the word, think of it later. Some of these mild symptoms may be present throughout a lot of the course of your Parkinson's disease, but don't necessarily mean you're on the verge of dementia. Okay. But um, I just wanted to highlight that too. Um, if you do get memory loss, like I said, usually the hippocampi are intact in Parkinson's disease dementia. So if you are have, struggling with memory loss and PDD, it's usually a secondary type of memory loss um, where these other things like um, executive dysfunction or something else you're struggling with cause a secondary loss of memory. Um, and so generally your encoding is intact. So you can take an information and it goes somewhere in your brain. Okay, these are the stages of memory encoding, storing, and retrieval, but you have more problems retrieving it for whatever reason. This is not typically the case in Alzheimer's disease. In Alzheimer's disease, you can't encode. So in general, these patients, when you tell them something and they forget it, you can cue them all, all day, but they won't remember. Whereas in Parkinson's disease, dementia, you know, if they forget it, you can cue them, say, oh, remember this or remember that, and they will... Um, typically can be able to retrieve it to some extent. So the memory, the memory complaints and the memory loss may look different. Well, how do you distinguish this type of memory loss? Well, you need neuropsychological testing. Um, I actually feel like if I had my way, everybody who came into our movement disorder center with a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease or some concern for Parkinsonism would just get neuropsychological testing so that we could get a baseline. And we're talking about you sitting down with um, a neuropsychologist and going through hours <laughs> of, of testing, actually. Um, and it just really is great at teasing out all these subtle differences, whether you can retrieve, whether you can encode, whether you have executive dysfunction. It really is helpful in figuring out your pattern of cognitive decline. What other workup should we consider for Parkinson's disease, dementia? So if if the patient has Parkinson's disease and comes in with a classic looking, um, a classic looking picture of slowly progressive cognitive decline after a decade plus of disease, and I get them neuropsychological testing and it shows a typical pattern of um, prominent executive dysfunction, some visual spatial dysfunction, um, then I won't do much else except maybe some lab studies to make sure there's no thyroid disease or, or um, significant B12 you know, uh, deficiency, which can also cause dementia. I think those things should be you know, definitely done for anybody with cognitive decline. So those are reversible. Um, but uh, I will assess for their psychiatric um, state. So Parkinson's disease, you're at risk for dementia. I mean, depression and anxiety. And if you have significant depression and anxiety, and it's uncontrolled, you can't really make a surefire diagnosis of dementia because your depression may be influencing your cognitive symptoms to the point that you look demented, but you weren't. So in, in general, um, these things need to be done. Lab studies, a bedside psychiatric assessment, and like I said, neuropsychological testing is, is key, I think, for helping to distinguish um, you know, the pattern of cognitive decline. Some other things to consider, if there are focal things, focal symptoms, or just unusual things about the timing or the rapidity, then an MRI brain will be helpful, okay? Remember, a lot of these dementias overlap, so Alzheimer's disease can occur in Parkinson's disease patients, okay? So, you know, looking at the hippocampi can be important if there's, if there's anything that's off about these other tests that you did 
Um, an amyloid or FDG PET scan can also be helpful for that reason. Notice I didn't put a DAT scan up here. DAT scans um, really correlate with motor disease. And so if you have a surefire Parkinsonism motor disease and you're developing dementia, you don't really need to do a DAT scan. You know you have Parkinsonism. Okay, so it would be more about just trying to figure out what your cognitive pattern is and how to manage that. Um, almost done. So pharmacological treatment of Parkinson's disease dementia. So um, there are no cures, unfortunately, for Parkinson's disease dementia, but there are different medications that we can use to mask um, symptom progression. One of the most common ones is acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Um, such as denepazil, rivastigmine, galantamine. And out of everything on this particular slide, um, rivastigmine is the only FDA approved drug for the treatment of Parkinson's disease dementia. It comes in a handy um, patch here, which I often um, go to first. Um, um, the NMDA antagonist, atypical antipsychotics, you have to be careful with if they have neuropsychiatric symptoms, you want to avoid ones that can work motor decline. And so therefore, quetiapine, clozapine, and pimavancerin are probably your safest bets. And then dopaminergic therapy adjustments. Do not forget that levodopa, while so helpful for motor symptoms and for so many Parkinson's disease patients, can actually worsen some of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease, disease dementia later on in disease. So it can worsen hallucinations and it can worsen, you know, delusions. And so you may need to address, uh, to adjust your therapy. And, um, you know, thankfully, I was preceded by, you know, some great talks. I don't have to talk about this as much, but I just wanted to make sure people knew that there are just natural ways you can maintain your brain health. And um, there's so much, you know, um, especially for exercise, there's so much data out there. And um, with that, um, I'm done. Oh, okay. So um, there are some questions here and I can certainly answer them. So can Parkinson's be hereditary? Yes, it can. So the vast majority of Parkinson's disease is sporadic, meaning it's not hereditary. So about 90% is sporadic, meaning it just pops up. Okay, but about 10% um, are familial. They pass down usually in an autosomal dominant way from generation to generation. So yes, there is a portion that can be hereditary. And I will say this, if you don't have familial and you have sporadic in your family, so you just have a close family member with Parkinson's disease, say you're their child, then your risk goes up somewhere between one in 100 over 65 to maybe two in 100. So it goes up slightly, but it's not like because you have sporadic disease that you have like a 50% chance of getting it or anything like that. Okay, so is levodopa only beneficial in tremor, par uh, tremor Parkinson's and not rigidity? No, 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 no. So actually, um, so levodopa is very beneficial, actually probably even more beneficial to some extent for bradykinesia and rigidity um, than it can be for tremor. Um, but all three of those, it helps. So bradykinesia, rigidity, and tremor, those are actually the only three things that um, levodopa is guaranteed to benefit in Parkinson's disease, okay? All this other stuff, it may help your mood a little bit, may do this, may do that, but not, not guaranteed. So no, no, no. So rigidity, yes, yes, uh, levodopa can benefit that. Is there an association between epilepsy and PD? You know, not, um, not that I'm aware of. Um, once you get into the later stages where you have cortical Lewy bodies and dementia and maybe some overlap with Alzheimer's disease, um, you may be at a greater risk for having um, some seizure activity. I know I recently attended a talk where uh, there was a talk on Alzheimer's and, and, and seizure activity, but um, in terms of motor PD, um, not that I'm aware of. And then are there defining differences between multiple sclerosis, cognitive decline, and decline oh, uh, associated with dementia? I'm not really sure. Defining differences between multiple sclerosis. Oh, I see. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not entirely uh, sure about this particular question in terms of MS cognitive decline. But one thing um, that you probably are noticing today is that to some extent at the end game of all these dementias, they all start looking a little bit similar. Okay, so that's all. 
Thank you, Dr. Higginbotham. At this time, um, I'd like to have Suzette Benford come forward and she will talk to us about some kinds of things that we can do to help um, cognitive function and one of the things that we're doing here at Emory. Ms. Benford. Okay, so advance. Okay, got it. Thanks, Dr. Parker. It's so great to be here. Thank you so much. Um, I am really excited to be here. Um, I work at the Emory Brain Health Center and I work specifically in a program called the Cognitive Empowerment Program, which is a program uh, for people with mild cognitive impairment. And we provide for them all the interventions that I'm gonna be talking to you today about uh, to help benefit their cognitive functioning and also just enhance their overall health and uh, quality of life. So what do we mean when we talk about therapeutic neuro interventions? The, the term just refers to uh, things that we can do to protect and preserve our brain cells, our neurons. And one of the goals of this kind of intervention is to promote the neuroplasticity of the brain. And that just is the ability of the neurons to reorganize themselves and to make new connections to maintain brain function. So even if you have Alzheimer's, dementia, or just normal aging, increasing your neuroplasticity will uh, help your brain function at its best. So we all want to know what we can do to reduce our risk of Alzheimer's disease. And you know the risk factors, and, and also just to preserve our brain health. And many of the risk factors are out of our control pretty much. Uh, aging, uh, our genetics, our gender. Uh, women are more likely to develop Alzheimer's, for example, than men. Um, and to some degree, anyway, head injury. Um, but there are other risk factors that we have some opportunity to affect and control. And those are vascular disease and lifestyle. So when we look at all the lifestyle factors combined, there are things that we can do in every avenue of the spectrum to uh, increase our neuroplasticity and to protect our brain health. Um, first of all, Dr. Benimer talked at length earlier about um, a healthy diet. Um, the MIND diet is one that combines the Mediterranean diet and a heart healthy diet. There's a lot of information online about that. Um, and then of course, physical exercise. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, sleep, of course, um, it's recommended that older adults average seven to, seven to nine hours of consolidated sleep a night. And I think people really underestimate the importance of good sleep hygiene. It really affects your brain health. And then cognitive stimulation, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, regular social interactions. Um, there's lots of research to suggest that um, social interaction and engagement throughout life is really important. And then finally, mood, uh, treating depression or other mood disorders and reducing stress. Um, depression, particularly untreated depression, um, is a risk factor for developing dementia. So how specifically does exercise benefit the brain? Think of you know anything that's good for your heart is good for your brain. 25% of every heartbeat's blood flow goes to the brain. It's the body's largest consumer of blood and, and uh, therefore oxygen from the blood. So we think about overall brain health, um, but specifically the, this increased blood flow to the brain enhances uh, functional connectivity in the frontal, posterior, and temporal brain regions that are important for reasoning, visual analysis, and memory. It supports neural systems, systems that are involved in memory. And there's also evidence that physical exercise increases the neural connection density. So these um, vascular risk factors, which Dr. Benimer also talked about at length, um, disrupt blood flow to the brain. And over time, that, that can affect your cognition. So hypertension and hyperlipidemia, diabetes, heart disease, sleep apnea, um, increase your uh, risk of developing stroke, uh, mild cognitive impairment, and dementia. 
So if we look at cognitive functioning over time, we see that with normal aging, there's a natural um, kind of normal decrease in our cognitive functioning, a slight decrease. But when you add onto that risk factors like, first of all, hypertension, you can see that in general, that causes cognitive functioning to decrease over time. And then if you add diabetes onto that, the decline is more rapid in general. And then if you add hyperlipidemia onto that, you can see that um, in many cases, it causes quite a precipitous decline. So these vascular risk factors are incredibly important to control. Dr. Benimer also mentioned metabolic syndrome, which is that cluster of conditions, uh, including high blood sugar and hypertension and high cholesterol and excess abdominal body fat. I start to look more like that as I get older. Um, but here is a, a really striking fact that um, hopefully will motivate you uh, to incorporate some of these lifestyle changes. Uh, in patients with metabolic syndrome, uh, the rate of progression from mild cognitive impairment to dementia was eight times higher than in MCI patients without metabolic syndrome. So if you have MCI, you're eight times more likely to develop, de to develop dementia if you have metabolic syndrome. Very motivating. So um, people are often confused about, you know, what degree do I um, exercise these changes, these lifestyle changes, and how much do I exercise? So as a long-term goal, um, the American Heart Association recommends that you engage in regular exercise of at least moderate intensity five days a week for 30 minutes or 20 minutes of vigorous activity three days a week. And also, of course, follow the, the mind or similar heart healthy diet. But if you can't do all of that at once, there are little small changes that you can make right away. So investigate and learn how to manage your vascular risk factors. Uh, incorporate exercise just in your day to day routine and do some kind of exercise every day, even if you're not hitting your goal. Uh, find a fitness partner. Fitness partners uh, generally increase the likelihood that you'll be successful with an exercise program. And then uh, eat as healthfully as possible. Um, fruits and vegetables, um, reduce your processed sugar and high fat foods. So let's move on now to cognitive stimulation. So cognitive stimulation also hits these other buckets in some ways of uh, social lifestyle factors and mood. Um, cognitive stimulation in general uh, throughout life and in late life leads to a lower incidence of dementia. It's correlated with um, lower um, incidences of dementia. It encourages social engagement because often your cognitive stimulation is being done with other people. It improves your mood, reduces boredom. It's related to greater brain volume, density, and functional connectivity, like we talked about, and more cognitive activity increases our cognitive reserve. So that just in general refers to the brain's um, ability to be resilient in the face of damage and changes. So what should you do? You know, it's, it's one thing to say you should be stimulating yourself cognitively, but you know, it's more than just doing the crossword puzzle or a word search. Um, the important thing is to do it regularly and do something that is challenging not too difficult, but not too easy, that's challenging. And it's also something that you find enjoyable enough to continue to do over time. So the kind of threshold, the, the benchmark um, that you wanna have as your minimum is to engage in cognitively stimulating activities for at least 30 minutes, three or more days a week. So 30 minutes each time, three or more days a week. So what counts? Uh, learning something new, that counts. Um, you can take a cooking class, an art class, a computer class. You know, here at Emory, we have a fantastic lifelong learning, um, a, a continuing education program called OLLI for older adults, which is a fantastic way to uh, learn something new. Um, one of the things that you'll often see held up as a, as a real, it's like a gold standard for um, cognitive stimulation is learning a new language or how to play a musical instrument. Uh, and engaging your brain with someone else also adds that um, social component into it. And it's really good to choose some activities that involve both 
mental and physical engagement, like dancing. So there's the physical aspect of that. There's the social component. And also it involves your brain because you're remembering how to do steps. Um, that's one of the best things that, that you can do. And that dual tasking, the combination, the combining of a physical activity with a cognitive activity um, is really, really uh, good for neuroplasticity. So what are some kinds of um, more formal cognitive training that you can do? You know, there are a lot of um, cognitive training programs uh, online now, um, computerized programs that use um, structured practice on cognitively challenging tasks. The one that we use in the Cognitive Empowerment Program is Brain HQ because it seems to have the most data around it in terms of effectiveness. Um, the pros to it are that it, visually it's really appealing. It's, it's fun to look at and fun to do. And the big thing is that it adapts to individual performance levels. So it's not gonna be having you do things that are too easy nor too hard. It, the program doesn't want you to get frustrated and just quit altogether. So the cons are there are there is a charge um, associated with it. The effectiveness can be mixed, and for some people, it's it's difficult to engage with. But our participants have really enjoyed it. Then there's other kinds of cognitive training. Um, for example, compensatory strategy training, and that's just learning everyday strategies to support cognition and and memory. Uh, and at Emory the memory support program was developed here. This is a great example of one of those cognitive training programs. And the calendar that you see there is one of the tools that's used in the memory support program. So the pros are it's visually appealing and it, and it is fun and it also adapts to individual performance levels. But the cons are if you're not in a research program, for example, um, and you're doing it privately, it can be expensive. And again, the the effectiveness can be mixed, and for some people, it's difficult to engage in. So what can you do today? Um, your long-term goal, again, is to engage in cognitively stimulating activities three or more days a week for at least 30 minutes at a time. But things that you can do right away, identify a new skill you'd like to learn or hobby you want to be more involved in, uh, join a club or a group, um, pursue opportunities for lifelong learning like an Ollie, uh, start a weekly card game or a club with a friend, and be more connected to uh, friends and family. Call a loved one to chat. So here are key takeaways for today. Um, it's so important to manage your modifiable risk factors and increase your physical and cognitive activity. And remember, even small changes can make a big difference. And the more changes you incorporate, the more benefit that you'll get. And it's really important to find things that work for you. Brain health is not one size fits all. So find things that you enjoy and that you can incorporate easily into your day-to-day -day routine. You can do it. <laughs> Go. Thank you, Suzette. Our very next speaker is Mr. Larry Graham. Um, we have questions in the chat and for everybody who's sending them in, we're trying to get through and we know we're 15 minutes over our two hour time, but we kind of anticipated that. If you just hold on for just a minute, we have just two more presenters and you're free to go at any time, but everybody has something valuable to say for those presenters. We have questions in the chat, kindly answer those things that are appropriate for you. Thank you, Dr. Graham, Mr. Graham. Thank you very much. I am assuming everybody can hear me. I um, just want to thank everybody for allowing me to talk today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I realize we're running a little bit behind schedule, so I'll talk quickly. My name is Todd Graham. I'm the executive director of the Louis Body Dementia Association. I'm here to share with you a little bit about who LBDA is and what we do. Um, and I'll try and make this brief, but uh, the end result would be if you had any questions or you want further information about LBDA, it can all be found on our uh, website. We were founded, uh, the LBDA was founded in uh, 2003. And let me just go to this here, one second. We were founded in 2003 by a small group of uh, 
people around the country who met online in a caregiver support group and were frustrated by the fact that there was very little information about caring for people with LBD and the understanding of the disease and the lack of awareness of from the healthcare community. Uh, by all accounts now, as uh, Dr. Galvin said before, um, there's uh, about 1.4 million people that have uh, the account for L Lewy body dementia. And we serve those who have the disease as well as the family members and caregivers that uh, serve them. We've grown a lot in the uh, last 17 years. Uh, we currently have about uh, 15 people in our on our staff. Uh, we're headquartered in, in Atlanta. Uh, and we are truly blessed to have a, a nationwide network of volunteers that kind of help, help us out in so many different ways. Our growth has greatly enabled us to um, do a lot more in the area of our service, and that uh, includes advocacy and research, and we'll touch upon those in a little bit. The mission of LBDA is to be the leading authority on Lewy body dementia. Uh, we are relentless in our search. Uh, we want to be the go-to organization when it comes to Lewy body dementia. Um, we are uh, anxious that we always try and work for support for those living with the disease and their caregivers. Just a few things about what we do, a uh, quick snapshot of some of the things that we do and the programs that we offer uh, for those that we serve. Um, the Lewy body dementia association website, um, as you can see, uh, this is our brand new site actually we launched it uh, last month uh, we're very proud of it and um, we are as you can see october is lbd awareness month we're actually running out of october but uh, nevertheless uh, basically this is the home base as i said before we um, provide a lot of information um, on the site whether you're someone that is looking for information about the disease for yourself or for a loved one uh, whether you're looking for information about uh, how, how caregiving is done, whether healthcare professional from specialist to uh, all the way to, you know, a professional caregiver, uh, all the information can be around LBD uh, and related dementias can be found on the LBDA site. So it's lbda.org. Uh, so feel free to check it out when you get a chance. <clears throat> One of the things we do pride ourselves on is education, education from uh, lay people as well as professional people. This is an example of some of the educational materials that you can find on the site. Um, they can either be read on online or they can be downloaded. Um, I think if you, if you had one uh, primary one you wanna check out, it would be this one that was published in conjunction with us uh, by the NIH. And it's a comprehensive look at Lewy body dementia, the disease. Uh, this latest one we have over here is facing uh, Lewy body dementia together. Um, that's from a caregiver aspect and what you as, if your loved one is uh, uh, challenged with Lewy body dementia, uh, some of the things you can uh, work together on. This smaller one here, you'll see is a, a medical alert card. That becomes very uh, important for uh, people with LBD. Uh, it alerts authorities that you have LBD and it talks about the drug interactions that could occur if it's an emergency room visitor, similar to that. So that's something you wanna look for on the site as well. Um, in addition, on the site, you can also sign up for our uh, newsletter, which keeps you informed every step, you know, every month a new, a new newsletter comes out, gives you updates on information that is available and things that are going on and things like uh, research and clinical trials and so forth. Uh, one of the things we're very proud of is um, are some of the educational, programs we're now embarked upon, as someone mentioned earlier, I think Dr. Galvin mentioned, Robin's Wish is a movie that came out in September. It was, it's available at, it's basically an hour and a half long uh, documentary about Robin and Susan Williams and their struggle with LBD. Uh, the fact that Robin was not uh, diagnosed with LBD until um, after he passed away. And some of the struggles that was faced by Susan uh, as she looked to uh, increase people's understanding of the disease. What, the other thing is the movie Spark, which we were actually launching uh, the end of this week, and we're, we're gonna be making it available to um, research centers of excellence, like Emory being one of them, so they can use it as an educational program. This is the, a shorter version of Robin's Wish, and it's more focused on the disease itself. It has a much 
a more in-depth look at uh, how the disease works in the brain and also looks at Susan's uh, challenges as a caregiver. So this will be highly helpful uh, and informative and educational for healthcare professionals, caregivers, and those with the disease. One of the areas that we also do a lot of work in is advocacy. And you know, we've been really kind of leading the charge in Washington and Bethesda, Maryland, working with the government and the NIH and NINS, and really kind of fighting on behalf of the uh, Lewy body dementia community so that when people think about Alzheimer's and dementias, and we wanna make sure everybody I mean, talks about and hears Alzheimer's and related dementias of which Lewy body dementia is one. So uh, we continually push the uh, government to get more funding um, for Lewy body dementia research. Our efforts are starting to pay off. If you look at some of the um, dollars that have been awarded over the last couple of years, uh, the percentage of money that's been going towards LBD research has been increasing. It's still much significantly smaller than that that goes for Alzheimer's, but we continue to fight nevertheless to, to bring more funding uh, into the LBD research area. Um, we also serve from an advocacy standpoint at, you know, kind of at the intersection between government, uh, industry, and the scientific community, uh, catalyzing uh, research efforts uh, for LBD. So speaking of research, uh, I think Dr. Galvin might've mentioned it earlier, but um, we are, um, you know, we've, we've created the top national research priority for Lewy bodies to find a better way to diagnose. So shortening the time to diagnosis and finding treatments for both the symptoms or disease modifying agents. In late 2017, we established the Research Centers of Excellence program. It's comprised of 26 of the top academic medical research centers in the US. We are honored to have uh, Emory be one of those research centers. So we work closely with Emory as well as many other institutions around the country. Basically the goals of the um, Research Centers of Excellence program is to establish a um, network of leading academic centers where people can go to get a, a consistent uh, diagnosis and treatment of LBD. Uh, we wanna increase the amount of medical education that's available for healthcare professionals, also provide support groups for people with the disease. So as a, as a result and a commitment of being a research center of excellence, each center has to commit to increased amount of medical education and increased amount of support groups. Uh, the last goal of this is to create a clinical trials ready network so that when uh, funding becomes available from the government and from industry, we can amount, immediately reach out to the uh, RCOE network and uh, start trials in a much more efficient and effective fashion. <clears throat> uh, last area I just wanna to touch upon is support. Um, support is one of the main pillars on which our organization was was built and we feel very, very strongly that support for those um, that are looking for help with, for better understanding with the disease, as well as those who are looking for help and caring for those with the disease is very, very important. One of the key areas is Lewy Buddies and Lewy Buddies are um, experienced caregivers who share their time and experience with LBD families. Um, they've walked the walk and they wanna talk the talk. They listen compassionately and co confidentially to some of the challenges that the families and the caregivers are, are facing. Uh, they can offer emotional support. They can refer uh, families and caregivers to additional LBDA programs and services as appropriate for their needs. Now, th this is available by reaching out uh, either by calling or email to the Louie line. And then uh, certainly the connections will be made so that the uh, Louis buddies can be in touch with you if you need additional help and support along the way. Now keep in mind, they're not medical professionals, so they really can't you know, di diagnose or treat, but they can certainly offer you all the benefits of the experiences that they have had. And we found overall, that's a lot that goes a long way in uh, making people feel better about what's going on. Um, we do have a, a, a network of support groups now, um, with COVID, they, all, all of these groups now meet virtually via Zoom, uh, but when pre-COVID and hopefully post-COVID, uh, these groups can meet in person uh, and they go a long way as well in terms of uh, being able to provide support and provide members with a better understanding of what, and what to expect uh, along the LBD journey. Um, we call this digital help, but basically we, we do maintain a number of online support groups uh, we have a number of Facebook groups that meet 
Uh, and these are all different types of groups. It could be people with the disease. We have a living well with Louis group. We have a caregivers uh, group that meets. We have a spouses of those with LBD uh, group that meets in, in uh, both online and in, via Facebook. Again, these are confidential, but and, and uh, I, we find that they're very, very helpful uh, providing people with a better understanding and support uh, as they go along. Also, you know, digitally, we have a number of, uh, in, in online lbda.org, we have a, a full uh, digital library and a, other information that's available to download that may be helpful uh, for you as well. I think that the, one of the key takeaways you want to, uh, from this brief session is, you know, we have a 800 number. This is on our website. We have, you can reach out by email. You know, we are here to help everybody. And if anybody needs help, they can feel free to reach out. And we'll certainly put you in touch with the um, people that you would need to talk to. Um, this is a tough journey. And um, the experience of our caregivers and our uh, volunteers and our network is, can be most helpful as you have a lot of questions that come along. So I just wanted to say, uh, I, Appreciate the opportunity for the brief overview. I know we're up against a, a time limit, but thank you. Um, on behalf of the LBD, I just want to thank you all for your attention today. Thank you to Emory for giving me the opportunity to share with you a little bit about LBDA. And thank you for all of you to take the time to listen. If there's anything we can do to help you, please reach out to us. Thank you so much, Mr. Graham. At this time, we have one final presenter and that is Mr. Whit Jefferson Morgan. And he's gonna tell you about our Emory Healthy Aging Study. We have a number of questions in the chat talking about family members and what should I do? I'm at risk, I'm 49 years old. Hopefully if you participate in our Emory Healthy Aging Study, we'll learn a little bit more about your risk for Alzheimer's and related dementias and give you an opportunity to basically learn a little bit more about your likely trajectory. Mr. Witt. Very much, Dr. Parker. Uh, let's see, let's just do the play button and get this started. All right, we're live. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, as Dr. Parker said, my name is Whit Morgan. I'm the communication specialist here in the Department of Neurology. Uh, I work for the Emory Healthy Aging Study, as well as our sub-study, the Emory Healthy Brain Study. Um, now, I know we've had a lot of different questions today about participating in research, how can you get involved in research, and um, I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about this particular study because it's a very unique research opportunity. So we're going to go ahead and dive right in then um, and talk about what the aging study actually is. Um, simply put, it is a longitudinal database project uh, where we are having our participants uh, complete an online health history questionnaire, and we're using that data to better understand how we age and what causes certain age-related diseases. Let's see, why is it not going forward? Try it again. There we go. Awesome. So who can participate in the aging study? And I know it's a little deceptive because it has aging in the name, but if you think about it, we're technically all aging as we go on day to day. And uh, the really cool thing about this is that it is open to anybody over the age of 18 that lives in the continental United States or US territories. Uh, if you can read and understand English and you have an internet capable device, you are able to participate in our research study. And that's because this particular research study is done entirely online. So for those that may not live near the metropolitan Atlanta area, uh, don't worry. If you want to get involved in our research study, you can actually help support us because you can do this from the comfort of your sofa. You can do it in your sunroom. You can go to a Starbucks, uh, pretty much any place that has internet connectivity, you can be a member. And so when I talked about building this database, um, what are some of the things that we're looking for? And specifically, when we're asking these questions on our uh, online health history questionnaire, we're looking at things like your general demographics, uh, how much exercise are you getting, uh, what's your diet like? You know, we've talked a lot about diet today, how important like the Mediterranean diet is, how much uh, fruits and vegetables are you getting, um, things of that nature. We're also looking at your activities and your habits. We want to know how often are you reading? How often are you uh, consuming media on the television as opposed to reading it online or reading it in a book? 
Uh, and we're also gonna ask you some questions about your medical history. Because as I said, we're trying to find all these different patterns that emerge from these data sets. They're gonna help us better understand how we age and what causes certain age-related disease. Now, when I mentioned that this is done online, the power of technology is pretty great because you don't have to have just a computer to do this. You can do it on an iPad, you can do it on your iPhone, you can do it on an Android phone. As I mentioned, any internet capable device will work for participating in a research study. And just to give you a little bit of a highlight of some of the people that have joined so far, I will note that we have over 30,000 people that have now registered for the Emory Healthy Aging Study. Our goal is 100,000. So we're definitely tracking well, um, but we want to keep those numbers going up. And just on the breakdown here, you'll notice uh, a pretty interesting demographic as far as the age group. The majority of our people are between the ages of 36 and 75. But that doesn't mean that if you're younger or older than that, that you can't participate. One of the big ones that I want to point out, though, is that gender. So we have more than 70% of our participants are female. Guys, we need to get you involved in research. This is a really, really easy way to do that. And also when we look at race, we really wanna make sure that we're getting an accurate representation for our minority groups. So for those that may fall into that category, please consider joining our research study. Now note, I will say all of this is entirely voluntary and you can withdraw at any point in time should you choose. Speaking of participating, let's talk about how difficult it is or actually better saying how easy it is because it involves two steps. Step one is take your internet capable device and go to our website, healthyaging.emory.edu. And when you're on our website, you'll see this clever button up in the top right hand corner that says join the study. It's bright, it's yellow, it's easy to spot and it's easy to get to. Once you click on that button, everything else will be walking you through the process of going through the online consent and actually going through and completing your online, online health history questionnaire. And that's how easy it is to get involved in research. Now, I do also wanna talk about one other study here that's technically a sub-study of the aging study. And this is our healthy brain study. So, as I mentioned, this is a sub-study for the aging study. It is a longitudinal study as well. Uh, but the focus on this one is a little bit more specific. So we're actually trying to understand the causes of Alzheimer's and dementia. This one is a little bit different of a participation criteria. Um, we are looking for healthy individuals between the ages of 50 and 75. And one of the reasons why it's so important to get that online health history questionnaire completed is because it'll help us identify potential participants. So we can use those demographics, some of the medical information, and if you are qualified or we think you would qualify for the brain study and would like to participate, then we would reach out to you. Now participation in the healthy brain study is just a little bit different. It does involve one uh, remote visit as well as two short in-clinic visits. And during that remote visit, we go through the consent, we go through a diet questionnaire, and then we do our cognitive testing. And during the two short remote visits, we will go through, we will collect biospecimens, we will do vascular testing, we'll do a uh, blood draw, lumbar puncture, and then we'll also do an MRI scan. And all of these uh, pieces of data on there are helping us better understand, again, the biomarkers to identify who's going to develop Alzheimer's and dementia. And so in the sake of time, I'm going to keep it real brief, but I do want to make sure that you've got my email address um, in case you have any additional questions outside of what you'd like to submit in the question box. Feel free to email me with any of that information or any questions regarding our research studies. And then I've also put our website on here, the, uh, uh, or the healthyaging.emory.edu email address. No. So for the Emory Healthy Aging Study, it's open to anyone in the United States. Thanks. Thank you, Wit. At this time, we've just about run. We were well over time. I want to thank each of our speakers for joining us today. And I would like to say for those of you who stuck on to the very, very end, we were supposed to have this program in the spring, but courtesy of the pandemic, everything had to be delayed and our usual program format has shifted. Hopefully in 2021, we'll be able to join you again in live and in person at the Panhellenic Center as we have customarily done and provided our lunch and all the other things that you're accustomed to. I wanna thank you so much for participating in our webinar today and our fall forum. And we look forward to seeing you on our Brain Talk Live every week. 
please feel free to join our Emory Healthy Aging Studies. If you have some questions, please email us and we will answer them offline, if you will. Anyway, thank you. Thank you so much for supporting our program. Please participate in research here. We hope to hear from you soon. Thank you.